Hello, everyone. Hello, History and Women's Studies 342U. Happy Wednesday. I am so sorry I cannot be with you today. Um, I've had an emergency that needs my attention. So I've recorded our lesson for today, and I hope you find it meaningful. And I'll be back with you on Friday. I'm excited about that. I'm going to share my screen and talk you through um, some things for today. So um, I think as you can see, I hope, um, we're in workshop mode today, and we will remain there um, through the end of the week. Um, so let's get going. Our agenda today, we'll do a little housekeeping before we dig into substance. Um, then I'm going to spend quite a little bit of time debriefing um, your free rights from Monday. They were very, very rich, and we'll provide a really important foundation for what we do this term in addition to the syllabus. And then we'll end uh, with a little in-class exercise, which will have you interacting with your neighbors and peers in the classroom and doing another one of those anonymous free writes. So hopefully um, it'll be enjoyable after um, I get done talking at you a little bit. So under housekeeping, just a reminder that uh, to follow your syllabus and that Friday you have two readings that are due in class, um, one by Glenn and one by Lou. And um, these are really phenomenal um, kind of big picture essays about how to think critically about the intersections of race, gender, and class when doing women's history. And uh, we'll come up with something clever for you to do uh, interactively to get you to do a deep dive into those uh, pieces. And you might want to look at your um, a keyword assignment for this week to make sure you're paying attention to the right things when you read the essay. I mean, they're very rich. There's no kind of wrong way to read them, but you do have a little extra writing assignment in your keywords. So read those pieces with your keywords in mind. Um, now a few another uh, announcements. Um, a reminder, I think I emailed uh, the class earlier in the week um, that today at noon is a special uh, celebratory reading of the memoir of a very important uh, woman in Oregon history, Avel Louise Gordley, um, who was the first African American woman elected to the Oregon State Senate. And um, this is her 75th birthday uh, year. She's a PSU alum. Uh, and a highly accomplished, important person in our community. So check out your pdx.edu email from me. Um, I think I sent it Monday and then register at OSU, um, Oregon State University uh, to uh, tune into the webinar. And I think you'll have a really enjoyable experience, very meaningful one, especially for our topic. Um, the second announcement is that your sign-up sheet uh, for weekly um, participation activities in our class is posted on the homepage of your Canvas, um, as well as in the student success module within the shell for our course. And I tweaked the syllabus um, visibility button. So hopefully the syllabus is now visible to everyone. And I think those are the main kind of logistic and structural uh, issues uh, to hopefully get us to the end of week one uh, in good shape. All right. And uh, I guess my last announcement is really a kind of bridge comment to the substance of our reflective kind of workshop mode uh, today. I want to double back to uh, one of the many um, fascinating and, and insightful things that were shared in here on Monday. Um, so, uh, and that has to do with some of these reflexive speech phrases, and we're going to be focusing quite a bit on those this week. And it has to do with the one around, um, you know, so that sorry, not sorry, I'm not trying to be racist, but kind of phrase that can be circulating out there in some discourse communities. And um, one of the things I just want to say about that is that if you have a comment, an issue, a memory, a story from your past or any of your experiences that you are concerned has racist content and may be offensive, um, so you're worried about sharing it in class, um, please share it with me. You can share it with me 
privately. You can share it with me over email. You can share it with me in a chit chat in the hall. And I'm here to listen and hear you and provide some perspective. So I really want to make it clear that I'm not here and our, our reflections on, on reflexive speech is not to squash speech, but to just be mindful about it and to be um, to think critically about how our words are are heard and how they might be interpreted. So my my basic uh, guideline is if you feel like it might not work in class or upset someone, you're probably right. Trust your judgment. But that doesn't mean ignore it. You can bring it to me and we can talk it through. Right. We can get some perspective on it. Um, you can't offend me. You can't offend me. I'm here to help. OK, so that's a good little, I think, bridge to the substance of what I want to start really with today, which is you. Right, which is your words and your perspectives, except first we have to call the roll. Here's the next screen. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to have I'm going to I'm going to wait five or seven minutes and have um, Jordan take care of the roll. And you'll see that I have the, the, the pronouns that I think I heard on Monday. So please correct those um, if you possibly can today. And, um, and I'll resume in a few minutes talking with you. Thank you. All right, well, Jordan can pause the video if uh, you need a little more time on the roll. And um, it's supposed to say check pronouns to make sure I have these correct. Thank you, not than you. So my bad. All righty, here we go. Deep breath. All right, so um, I'm going to share out with you, uh, share back with you some of the first, some of the learning goals. You had two uh, response prompts on Monday. One was to identify some learning goals and the other was to sort of reflect on your standpoint, particularly using the idea of experience and how experience might inform your standpoint as a student, as a scholar, as a historian. But first we'll start with learning goals because these were really great too. They were all really great. So um, uh, you'll see here a kind of condensed paraphrased list uh, and you'll see some asterisks which indicate that the, a number of people uh, voiced very similar goals and objectives. So you have a sense of solidarity there, common ground. So just uh, really quickly through this uh, bulleted list here. So number of folks want to improve their writing skills. Came to the right place. We're going to do lots of writing. Uh, people want to get better at public speaking and using their voice. Wonderful. Um, need a critical perspective on early feminism. I thought that was really 
pertinent, very salient for a history course that, of course, looks at change over time. So again, came to the right place. Um, a number of people interested in this word intersectionality. What is it? How does it work? How can I use this concept better in my work and in my life? A couple asterisks there. A number of folks says they wanted to better engage the reading into their learning in the course. And um, I, I paraphrase the word in, engage, the person said engage, but I think they meant integrate. Um, could be, I could be misinterpreting here, but I think that's what the student meant and a couple other people did as well, like how to um, not keep your academic reading in a silo, but have it inform your voice, right? Your assignments and then maybe beyond the classroom, ideally. Um, a number of people, uh, perhaps inspired by the dialogue we had on Monday, um, noted that they'd like to work on their unique perspective, right, their standpoint, and how to convey the basis for their standpoint, their insights um, to, to people who are close to them, so family members, friends. So again, breaking down the silo between your academic voice, your scholarly voice at school, and trying to kind of translate that into um, everyday use and everyday uh, uh, power, which I think is wonderful. And then a number of folks voice this idea about correcting and filling in missing contributions to history and society um, accomplished by women of color. Uh, people, a number of folks, uh, women of color, people noted BIPOC uh, contributions to history, Latina, Hispanic women. Um, again, my goal here is very much to, to do that uh, and that our readings and our syllabus really uh, hopefully reflects that. And, and then, of course, our, our extra learning activity, if you want to engage it today, uh, listening to the life of Abel Fordley, you know, this is a huge issue in my own work. So hopefully we'll make some progress on those. So great learning goals. And again, lots of overlap in the room. So I hope people find some, you know, some, some energy, some, some solidarity there eventually. Um, and so what I've done in the next slide is to kind of drill down a little bit and say, you know, how the course content in fine is going to engage with your learning goals and support your learning goals. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, at least I'm not going to exhaustively go one-to-one -one right now, but we will bear these in mind consistently as we go forward. So when, um, when students say things like, I want to improve my writing skills or get better at public speaking or integrate the readings into my learning or work on conveying my perspective to people, you know, to people close to me, like friends and family. Um, I have a couple of responses, you know, in terms of writing skills, like we talked about Monday, you know, sort of what is helpful comments, what are not helpful comments, what are the unstated standards for persuasiveness or, or solid um, critical thinking and analysis versus the sort of um, stated standards, but that are not helpfully stated. Here's my response. Um, we talked, these are all around gatekeeping in specialized discourses, right? So people, so jargon, um, fire, paywalls, and library uh, articles, right? All of these things are mechanisms that keep people and keep conversations se separated. So a few things, a few things to break down gatekeeping. One is your syllabus itself contains sort of um, the keys to the kingdom in terms of what I'm looking for in papers. Lots of times students say, what are you looking for? Well, I try to be, I try to at least put on paper and then over time unpack what I'm looking for. So very simple things from I'm looking for a title, I'm looking for use of sources, I'm looking for no block quotation. There's some very basic things that you can look at your syllabus and, and not uh, I'm not going to put in the margin, do better. I'm going to say, see bullet point three on page six of the syllabus. So at least, you know, at least we have something to refer to. The other reference point is the grading rubric that's in Canvas. And, you know, we're going to spend some time going over that closer to our first paper. But again, it gives you, uh, I try to put in, in language um, exactly what an excellent versus an okay versus a fair versus a poor argument, right? Or paper structure or title, you know, looks like in, in, you know, not just in history, but sort of in academic writing. And then finally, um, I often find it's important to actually meet with students about their writing. 
And we did this last term. It was very, I think, very successful. And um, individual conferences are coming. So I would, I would suspect by by paper number three, we'll probably um, set up individual ten minute Zoom conference uh, conferences about your papers. And you'd be surprised what we can get done in ten minutes. It's really great. And the other thing that I didn't put on the slide, which is always true, is I will read any draft you care to send me. So again, it's not mysterious what I'm looking for. It's not. It's not supposed to miss, be mystified. I'm trying to be, you know, highly engaged and transparent in supporting your learning. So there are some things to break down gatekeeping and help people reach their learning goals. Um, the, on the point around needing critical perspective on early feminism, this is great. You know, sort of. It's great to think in history, like how early is early, uh, but uh, we've got most of the 20th century to look at. So we're gonna be in particular looking at this idea of uh, the colloquial expression of waves of feminism, first wave, second wave, third wave. Um, you know, the, the formal lecture on that framework is actually kind of near the end of the course because that metaphor came on board in popular and academic discourse relatively recently, but, it will probably be referred to um, along the way, and we will scrutinize sort of how scholars, for better or for worse, um, think about uh, sort of chapters or episodes of feminist um, activity or feminist thought, and do those frameworks work? Are they interesting? Are they helpful? Are they not? And where can we go with those? So hopefully we'll meet that pretty squarely. And then this um, other wonderful uh, learning objective about how to convey and converse with people about your academic work um, outside of the classroom, right? Um, with family and friends outside of school, in, in, your, in your work lives, in your activist lives, in your creative lives, in your social lives. So, I mean, I guess I have two, at least two things, and we can come up with more to say about that. One is that maybe our Friday sessions are, when we think about the reading and we think about sort of creative activities to deepen our engagement with weekly reading, let's practice translating that in real time. You know, we can we can do some role plays. We can do some, you know, what do you say on the, at the check stand at Safeway? What do you say at Thanksgiving dinner? What do you, you know, we can just, we can just go right there and do some wonderful experiments in translating. I mean, right, the word intersectionality might be kind of a game, might be kind of a buzzkill, right, at Thanksgiving dinner, who knows? Um, probably would not go over too well at my house either. So what can we say besides a word like intersectionality or the way that other phrases are demonized right now, like critical race theory, sorry, we're gonna be doing lots of critical race theory if you haven't, if you haven't noticed, but we can also do it without saying it and upsetting people with the buzzword. So we have ways. And so I think we should use our Friday sessions to, um, to translate. Again, not to be sneaky, but to sort of try to meet our different interlocutors where they are. And I think that'll be a great use of all of our time. And the other thing I thought would help with this translating issue is um, actually one student came up to me at the end of class and sort of had a little family story to share about uh, just an outline about one of our topics this term and, and they were pretty excited about you know kind of connecting this personal family story to some of the things we're going to be studying in class yes awesome and so again maybe we make intentional space for i mean i'm thinking about fridays but it obviously could be any time but we could be more intentional about it in the student directed segments of the weekly class um, to bring in family stories memories objects pictures images um mementos you know whatever brings this material to life i think um is is all is all to the good in terms of um, again, integrating, right? That word integrating or engaging your learning at a deeper level. So um, I hope that these preliminary responses to your wonderful learning goals are encouraging. I feel very encouraged uh, by the energy and the sort of ambition that was articulated in these learning goals. So I and Jordan, we will do our best to meet those where you are. And with your help, right, we'll do it together. We'll try to bring them to uh, to full flower and fruition. So that was pretty that was pretty fun to, for me to get to read um, your free rights. So thank you for those. 
And um, so on faith, oh, so let's go with another little, another little deeper dive. So again, a lot of asterisks by the word intersectionality. So I just thought, you know, let's map it out today. Since today I knew it was going to be a little bit, um, a little bit unusual in terms of the time I don't get to spend with you. So, um, I, you know, and I'll post this, uh, I'll post this video on our um on our canvas and, and the PowerPoint that goes with it as well. If you don't want to sit through the whole video and you want to scroll, um, I thought I'd just give you a good solid footnote and a good solid, you know, kind of working definition of intersectionality. So first the footnote, because it's a history class. Uh, intersectionality is a concept generally credited to Black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw uh, based on her article, Demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, and anti-racist politics from the University of Chicago Legal Forum from 1989. A mouthful, right? These are these are powerful concepts. These are scholarly concepts. So that's a lot for the dinner table, right? Uh, but it is absolutely critical to our course. So we want to give it this concept pride of place and work with it very carefully. And you can go read the full article if you so choose, not an assignment, it's just an extra thing if you want to look at it. I'm going to define it for you um, in the next slide. So intersectionality. What is Crenshaw saying? What is her argument? Well, she says a, a number of wonderfully and astute um, uh, th points. She makes a number of wonderfully astute points in this piece. One is she says, because of the evolution of U.S. legal discourse, if you will, certain categories in the law, like race and sex, have remained segmented. They they they're different words, right? They they operate as distinct categories. And because of this separation, it's a linguistic and grammatical and also kind of political se separation, African-American women have had trouble getting full legal remedies for discrimination. So she gives a few examples of this. Basically, she talks about how the law will acknowledge that African-American women are sort of covered by racial discrimination statutes, et cetera. But they have hesitated historically to remedy claims for, for discrimination that look or sound sexist. Okay. And so, because the way that African American women experience racism often has a sort of gendered dimension to it, they often, their remedies often slide off the case and they often fail to get um, relief. When African-American women bring cases on the base of what you might call regular racial discrimination, again, she does a really good job of talking about how there's really kind of no regular discrimination, right? It's always nuanced. Courts have been unwilling to offer remedies to Black women that seem to create a super citizen category. In other words, it, that threatened or seemed to make Black women into citizen who can bring claims on two bases of identity. It's really quite... It's really quite astonishing how this has happened over the years. Both of these tendencies, the sort of the way that sexism sort of slides off Black women's legal claims to discrimination and the unwillingness to acknowledge sexism as creating a sort of twofer category for Black women, both of these are endemic, they're patterns, and they leave Black women unseen and unprotected in the eyes of the law, and it's very unfair. So Crenshaw argues that if we, instead of leaving these two words, race and sex, so separate, as separate nouns, and if we see them as connected, right, or intersectional, um, the law does not create a super citizen identity, but in fact helps everyone convey how power and power inequities play out in their life, because on some level, everyone's identity is intersectional, right? Everybody is made up of multiple categories of meaning and, and heritage and identity, and power works on us in multiple ways. Nobody just has one identity or one vector of power operating in their life. We're all multiply located individuals. That's what I kind of say in my 
teaching standpoint. So as Crenshaw puts it at the very last sentence of her article, when they, that is when black women enter, we all enter the law fairly as citizens. So I'm, I, I suspect that some of this will be familiar, but the great thing about reflecting on it together is that now we're same page, right? I'm sure piece, folks have had pieces of this understanding well in their, well in their pocket. But now we kind of can, again, same page ourselves and have a, a stepping off point together. So in general terms, an intersectional analysis invites an encompassing, flexible understanding of how power works in specific instances, rather than presume that sexism does this or that, or that racism looks like this or that, and that's how we know when it exists, okay? So I'm not gonna spend any more time on it uh, right now. We'll come back again and again to this. It is one of your uh, keywords for this week. Um, so um, think on it, try to put it into your own words, and we will use it uh, with hopefully with increasing effectiveness as the term goes on. All righty. All right. So deep breath. Now I'm going to, intersectionality is a great stepping off point for this reflections on experience and standpoint, which I asked you to respond to also on Monday. So I'm just going to read these wonderful uh, insights. And I didn't, you'll see that there are less than 14 because there was sort of some resonances between a few of these. So hopefully you'll see, if not your own words, but something close. And if, and if you really feel like you haven't been heard in this exercise, please, you know, we'll connect with me and we'll, we'll make it right. But I think I got the kind of spectrum of uh, reflections on standpoint and experience that will be very, very helpful. And I think more or less inclusive for, for our purposes today. So first off, um, I tend to, so these are quotations. These are direct quotations from the free rights. I tend to associate experience with personal history and how these experiences shape our scholarly opinions. Or even more succinctly, someone said, experience is an opinion. Very interesting. Um, another comment, I want to expand my view of what others' lived experiences are like. Great. Uh, also, like, there's like no wrong answers in terms of standpoint. What we're doing is we're listening. We're listening and trying to sharpen our ears about how each of us apprehends the world and what are each of our thresholds for meaning making and proof and things like that, things that we don't often talk about. So we have to mostly listen. Next one. In my experience, education is rooted in anti-Black racism. I must be very mindful to not internalize self-hatred or racism in the guise of learning. Extremely powerful. I am critical of the methodology of scholarship due to its limited public availability and its use of language and terms that unnecessarily raise difficulty. Living in middle-class white liberal spaces has made me very skeptical of performativity. People saying what they're supposed to say, but not thinking critically or taking action. Very powerful. I tend to take an anti-capitalist and Marxist approach to history, even going as far as being described as a conspiracy theorist. I don't think there's a typo there. I truly believe that almost everything is connected and that and that, that situation is rarely an accident. Powerful. Uh, my experience as a daughter seems to overwhelm my perspective. Very poignant. My experience as an atheist woman shapes my understanding of history. So very poignant. My femininity has always been socially punished. So I've grown extremely protective of it. I feel my experience as Mexican American has made me very critical of history. I always like to hear both sides of history. Wonderful. These are rich, thoughtful, very thought provoking standpoints. And I am not here to criticize them, to 
fix them, okay? We're in listening mode. We're in listening mode. There are many ways to do academic history. There are many ways to live in the world. What I wanna do is just share a few reflections on what I think I'm hearing in the room with us because it's super interesting. And I think it will help us proceed again with, with this sharpening of the ears exercises that we're doing this week in the workshop. So here's what I think I'm hearing in these really wonderful and insightful and poignant comments. I think I'm hearing at least three frames or three continua, if you will, three ranges of standpoints, okay? There might be more. I'm gonna just focus on three for right now. On the one hand, we have some folks who, are, who say that opinion, is merely personal. In other words, our perspective, our individual perspective is simply our own. On the other end, we have a point of view that says, systems are so interconnected as to almost be conspiratorial. In other words, the individual disappears within the systems that seem so overwhelming. Okay, So I think that represents a, an interesting range like how to find the self. Is the self, are we just a self that's just an opinion or are we completely lost in systems that seem so tightly integrated and so um, consistent in their patterning that forget opinion, opinion is minion, right? So that's really interesting to think about. I mean, discuss, we could spend all class, just all term, just talking about how, how, does, how do individuals even exist in the kind of political and historical moment that we that we operate in. And in a sense, we will do this, <laughs> uh, but by looking backwards, okay? So I just wanna sound that out. Another range of standpoints that was articulated is there were folks who sort of said, you know, kind of my family or my social identity is really determinative, is really primary in how I move through my studies, how I move through the world. And on the other end of that, I heard people say, my social or, or family identity has been consistently negated and punished or invalidated. Okay, think about that. We've got people in the room who feel kind of awash in their family or assigned identity. And then there are people who feel kind of bereft or um, embattled, you know, or invisibilized in their family or social identity. So we've got a range here, range. A third kind of continuum, if you will, that I think I heard is on the one hand, um, folks who are sort of saying, you know, scholarly or or professional discourse, you know, academic discourse is, you know, kind of suspect, it seems unwelcoming, it's, it's the problem, it's sort of completely tangled up with racism, white supremacy, classism, uh, sexism, you know, that this is really part of the problem. And, um, you know, I have to be, you know, highly critical and highly uh, critically engaged with those. And on the other perhaps side of the spectrum is this sense of really needing some other discourses, let's call them historical discourses, it's a history class, to be more meaningfully integrated into people's daily or regular life, right? Because they need to get some traction on, you know, whatever is not working for them or that their need to find a voice, or their need to sort of create some distance from um, pressures or identities that seem to be not working. And I would also say that those two ends of the continuum can exist in the same person. I would say they exist, those two extremes of the continuum exist in me. I'm, I tend to be very suspicious of scholarly discourses for all the reasons just listed. And yet I find that I also need them on some level. So, um, you know, same goes for opinion. Sometimes students say, is my opinion, can I use my opinion? Well, what else are you going to use? You have to use your opinion to write a paper. You have to use your standpoint, right? Our, 
our challenge is to how to bring our standpoint, our view, our opinion, if you will, into relationship with some of the rest of the ideas going on in the class and in the world, right? If if all we needed was opinion, we wouldn't need school. We wouldn't need to talk to one another. We could just go home. But I think we're all here because while we may have a strong opinion or we may be still forming our opinions, we don't want to do that work in isolation. And um, that is one of the you know, values that I still stand by in terms of school and class and study is that we get to be in dialogue with one another and form our opinions, but not have them, but, but also have them challenged, but also have them challenged occasionally. So those are at least three frameworks that I hear in your standpoints. I think these are all highly productive and, um, you know, I welcome the testing and scrutiny of these views. And who knows, maybe they will adjust or change um, as the time as our time together um, continues. That's, that would be my hope. But they, they change in ways that is useful to you and that maybe take some inspiration from some of the voices that we encounter in our work together. So as I noted about your standpoint, free rights, which are, again, thank you for sharing. Um, we're mostly just listening now. Right? I'm just listening. And maybe we, and, and I, I want to spend time and workshop this week for listening. This is our listening time. Who are we? What are our standpoints? What's at stake here? Can we build a learning community that helps us hear one another? And maybe our best goal I have written down here is, is better listening and attention to what people's boundaries are in terms of their personal story, in terms of their ideological commitments, in terms of their politics, in terms of their standpoint. That would be great. That would be great. Um, just a few more reflections. Some of us have not had our perspectives valued, validated, or made visible in dominant structures. Some of us have. So one of the things to be mindful of, I think, in our class is, you know, to, to get to know uh, one another enough to know hmm, this this person's opinion has not been valid, has not been valued, has not been heard, has not been listened to. So maybe I can maybe I can hold on and let them, you know, and listen, right? And if I'm someone who has had their perspective validated, maybe I can be okay with that and and give and give myself even more permission to listen to somebody else. Maybe those two perspectives are not in conflict. Maybe they're think of Tessie Lou's reading this week, maybe they're different because they're actually in a relationship that we want to understand. Okay. So my point is that if our standpoints, if our perspectives, even our personal experiences might be reflection points, how did you come to your experience? How did you come to your uh, standpoint might be useful. We, we might usefully unpack and, and explore with one another what shapes our standpoint. We also want to proceed with care and caution, right? That these are, um, again, we're not here. History is not about um, proving or disproving anybody's standpoint, but understanding it, understanding it. And, you know, maybe unpacking it, maybe not, depending on the situation. Okay, so just proceeding with care and caution about people's perspectives. Um, a number of the free rights, and I think a couple that I put up on the previous slide, is this idea that stories and history has, has sides. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting perspective. I mean, it's sort of like, yeah, where did we learn that? that issues have sides. And I think we probably, I know I learned that, you know, story, there's two sides to every story and only two sides. <laughs> Maybe not, right? Maybe there's more than two sides. So this idea though, that there are multiple perspectives, right? And, um, and to be critical, the idea that there's only two sides, you know, let's put a pin in that one. You know, maybe there's quite a bit more than two sides. Um, but two is a good starting point. Um, just to be mindful, how, how do we think arguments, scholarly debates should go? How do we think about truth? Is it either true or false? Could it be partially true and partially false? Is that meaningful? Why, when, how? So might we think of our standpoints and our stories? Here's my final bullet point here. 
might we think of all of our stories and all of our standpoints as actually intersecting or even intersectional? That is that all of our standpoints, each and every one, deserves careful attention and exploration, can be something that can be a site of learning, rather than our standpoints being in competition or canceling each other out. Now, we might get to a point where we have a Freudian analysis over here and a Marxist analysis over here, and maybe the twain shall never meet. This is the 300 level course, so we won't necessarily get to that kind of kind of vetting of frameworks. Um, I'm also someone who's not fluent in Freudian or psychoanalytic perspectives on things. So it's a little bit of a red herring point, but I think you the you think you see my where I'm going here. Um, whatever we do in this class will be more of a first word right on the place of feminist race critical perspectives rather than a last word, right? So it's a it's a, a way to begin to explore what is the contours of these kinds of analysis going to look like for you and how do they um, how can they be beneficially, productively compared and contrast to what your colleagues in the class or I might be doing with similar material? Um, I'm much more interested in each of you being able to voice the stakes involved in your standpoint, rather than like proving your standpoint is going to be just what you need now and for all times. Or these are provisional thought experiments, okay? It's the quality of your thought experiment with yourself and with your colleagues that I'm interested in. And that I hope we can take a kind of flexible and maybe inter call these intersectional explorations. So those are some of my, um, some of my, um, thoughts, thought experiments in response to the things you shared on Monday in terms of learning goals and your beginning of an articulated uh, standpoint for our studies. Um, and as I've kind of been highlighting today, I'm interested, I'm interested in listening to you and hearing what you all are interested in learning about and interested in exploring. And, you know, of course, you're going to have to do some listening to one another this term, although I do, I am a bit of a talkaholic and you will hear some lectures and, you know, I will do my fair share, probably more than my fair share of talking. Um, but we will do our best to, to balance that with um, time for you to listen to one another. So as a first exercise in this kind of structured and intentional form of listening, I would like uh, to do a, you to do a little exercise. It's called the silent interview. Okay, So it's an interview without talking. It's a little bit of a contradiction. We're going to listen to one another oddly, or more like listen to yourself uh, without talking. So it's about your intern, listening to your internal, right? To your reflexive side of your brain, as opposed to your performative side of your brain. So you do, you're not required to participate in this um, activity. It's voluntary and it does require you to partner up with someone in the class and, and visually observe them. You know, you don't really have to stare at them really hard, but you do have to, I am asking you to visually observe your neighbor. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you do not have to participate. For some of us uh, have been taught really to not stare at someone, not eyeball them, it's not polite, it's not safe. Um, so no judgment about participating or not, but most people who think it might make them uncomfortable, they kind of wish that they did the activity because it can be kind of fun. So it's voluntary. Um, so check in with, so this in, this exercise asks you to sort of check in with a neighbor who's sitting near you in, your, in class, either next to you, but in front of you, behind you. Um, don't introduce yourself. We're still, we haven't had our name tags yet. We haven't quite gotten there. Um, try not to speak, but what I'd like you to do in pairs is silently interview your partner for about five minutes and take out a piece of paper, and answer the following questions. These will not be collected. Um, try to look at your partner, no hand signals, uh, no, you know, no 
American Sign Language uh, and answer the following questions. Uh, what did this person have for breakfast this morning? What is this person's favorite kind of music? What is this person's main hobby in life? Um, how did this student arrive on campus today? That's a question about transportation. Did they walk? Did they take the bus? Did they drive? Did they ride a bike, et cetera, skateboard? Um, and then finally, what is this person's political affiliation, if any? So again, please no talking. Take out a piece of paper and something to write with. Take about five minutes, and then I have a few more instructions, and then I will pretty much stop talking, and you will be wrapping up class with Jordan, uh, and then you're free to go till Friday. So please begin your silent interviews.
Okay, so if you need a few more minutes, feel free. Um, and now you can talk to your neighbor and check your answers and see how you did.
All righty. So hopefully you've had some time to check your answers. And depending on how much time you have left in the class, what I'd like you to do is to do some reflection on what you learned about yourself during the exercise. This is another anonymous free write. It's ungraded. Don't put name on it. But reflect on what your brain did, right, when you had to make some judgments, right, about make some assumptions about your neighbor and what that what that brought up for you in terms of a learning environment, in terms of creating dialogue about standpoints. So if you have time, you're free to talk, you know, maybe Jordan can run a little bit more discussion and oh, you can share out a little bit of what you all learned. Uh, but I do want you to put some things on paper for her to collect so that I can appreciate what you learned in this exercise. And again, fold that into what's becoming, I hope, our classroom aspirations, our classroom process, or some of our learning, shared learning goals for the term. So, um, so please turn in some writing to Jordan. Um, don't forget to do your reading in Unequal Sisters for Friday. Uh, we'll debrief both things uh, when we see each other again. And uh, I look forward to that time uh, very much. Thanks for everything and have a great day.